Hi everyone, uh, my name is Stefano Girovanos. I'm the director of the Remark Institute, and I'm also the person who's asking you to silence your phones at this point. Uh, welcome to the Remark Institute, where we get the chance to host a, a talk by Charlotte Kishar. Uh, I'm going to simply introduce Meredith Martin, uh, who will then in turn um, introduce Charlotte and then uh, um, share the, the session as we go. Uh, Meredith Martin is Associate Professor of Art History at NYU and uh, most recently the co-author of The Sun King at Sea, um, Galley Slavery and Maritime Art in um, sort of Louis XIV. Um, I messed up the last part of that, but that's not very complicated. Um, and uh, she also has this fantastic exhibition up right now at the New York Public Library called Fortune and Folly in 1720 and formerly also called Meltdown. I think it's uh, no longer um, a very nice thing to discuss in public. They canceled <laughs> and, it for me. So um, she's uh, going to do the pleasure of introducing uh, Charlotte and chairing the session as we go. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. And thank you all for being here today. And most especially, thank you to Charlotte. Exciting. I'm um, privileged to hear about some of her work in progress, and I will just introduce her briefly and then turn it over to Charlotte Guichard, who is Director of Research at Paris's Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique and a Professor of Art History at the École de Marseille. She's a leading scholar of 18th century European art and visual culture with a special interest in the history of collecting amateur practices and the art. She's been the recipient of numerous fellowships and honors, including a Panofsky professorship in Munich and a, residence, a residency at the Villa Medici in Rome, um, in addition to her current NS Remark Fellowship. And she's the author of many publications, too many to recount here, but including among them a book on the figure of the amateur in 18th century France, another on graffiti in early modern Rome, and a third on artist signatures, concepts of authorship from the 18th to early 19th century. One of these books has kind of transformed our field in its own way. More recently, Dr. Guichard's work has focused on visual and artistic circulations in the early modern world. And I'm delighted to report that her most recent book, Colonial Bateau, Empire, Commerce, and Galantry in 18th century France will be published by the end of the year. For her talk today, she's very generously agreed to present on her new research project on the art of embarquement in 18th century France. So, Join me in welcoming Dr. Kishar to the New York. Thank you very much, Meredith, for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, and thank you, Stefanos, uh, Amy, and um, Ananta for hosting me here at the Remark Institute. <clears throat> I'm very grateful. Um, so, um, uh, as a matter of fact, I indeed uh, started a new project that I've uh, uh, to you today, and um, it's um, pre, um, uh, entitled uh, The Art of Embarkment. So uh, this new project um, started with um, this painting by Antoine Watteau, where I did just mention, first entitled Pedrinage à Citer, featuring uh, amorous couples embarking or debarking, actually, it is not clear, who are from the island of Cythera, the island of love. The painting, emblematic of the French Rococo, was exhibited to the public for the first time in Paris in 1717, just at the time when a new trade company was launched, the Mississippi Company, who started the French colonization of Louisiana based on a huge speculation by the French shareholders, which was called uh, the Mississippi Bubble until the crash of 1720, and Stefanos just uh, uh, mentioned uh, the incredible exhibition uh, curated at the New York Public Library uh, that you have to see. Um, the painting uh, of Watteau has remained a sort of enigma for art historians, very open to a large range of interpretations. Was it a representation of uh, new pleasures of the courtly society, a scene of utopia, uh, and reverie, celebrating amorous pleasures. Well, in a previous work, I argued that this painting visually manifested a new colonial imagination framed within earlier codes of galanterie. These codes were indeed um, very powerful at the time, inherited from the reign of Louis XIV. And we saw uh, in literature, uh, opera, 
trainings, uh, scenes of departure, uh, to eyes of love, embarkations, gallant encounters, uh, all very important scenes, uh, novels, court ballets at the time, which, uh, as I claimed in the book, uh, contributed in turn to the colonial imagination that took shape uh, shape, sorry, during the Regency years. So this interpretation was based on a new set of images and contexts. Indeed, there is another uh, painting by Bateau, who was himself uh, a shareholder um, uh, in the Mississippi Company. Uh, and this painting is only known today through an engraving that you can see. Okay, I have to speak up. Tell me if you don't hear me. Um, so I think that this engraving sheds light on the context of colonization. The painting was entitled The Departure for the Islands, and it represented, imbued with literary stereotypes, the forced emigration to America of women who were poor or worked as prostitutes with them uh, in the engraving. This engraving and this painting by Vato obviously uh, dialogued with images of the time more directly uh, linked and connected to these contemporary events of forced immigration. So here is an engraving, uh, undated engraving, which uh, clearly um, um, employed, I mean, you know, the same theme of uh, forced immigration. These images allow us to, uh, to wave together gallant visual uh, themes and maritime expansion, gallant imagery, and the violence of the French Empire. Indeed, uh, in the engraving after Vato, and I give you here a detail, the detail of the intermingled but distorted hands leaves no room for hope for the young girl. So my claim today is that the art of embarquement can be interrogated twofold. First as a representation, but also as a practice for men and women who became more and more familiar with the sea, and especially for artists who started to get on board on ships as dessinateurs embarqués, um, on board draftsmen, precisely in the long 18th century. So I would like to show that emotions and anxiety and violence in most cases remained contained, if not erased, in century French imperial visual cultures. So um, the embarkation scene uh, indeed became central in the state institutions which supported French imperial and colonial trade. So here you have a sketch of the ceiling of the Banque Royale in Paris, uh, which is today the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and the ceiling is now destroyed. The, the, the Banque Royale was, was opened in 1790 in the wake of the financial bubble of the Mississippi, and it promoted trade and investment in Louisiana through the images that you can see here of ships. So uh, here you see the mast and the ships, allegory of rivers. Uh, uh, here you see uh, the Mississippi and the sea, which are engaged in gallant encounters. At the end of the century, uh, the ceiling of the Bordeaux Opera once again played the embarkation scene. This large fresco, uh, which was painted by Jean Baptiste Robin, um, shows uh, the city of Bordeaux protected by the gods. And uh, on the right, well, I couldn't have the right details, so that you can get in the mass with the safe trade and the wine trade for which Bordeaux was celebrated. So here, the motif of embarquement, embarkation, explicitly gained a new meaning as a colonial and commercial trope when France started to build an empire in North America. In the 19th century, um, the Bourse du Commerce, oh, here, this is the engraving, I know, really, and all the putti, which was referred to the Bateau Pellegrinage uh, to theater. Um, okay, last. Um, image, maybe um, the ceiling of the Bourse du Commerce, uh, which was built for the Exposition Universelle in 1889, and which today houses the Pinot Collection in Paris, exhibited a large panorama showing France's global commerce with similar scenes of embarkation, loading, and unloading of goods. 
So all these paintings introduce us to the embarkation scene. Of course, Vato and the painters I just mentioned did not embark on a ship. Their paintings delineated a dreamscape, a space of desire and projection for men and women who invested a lot of money in the colonies, depicted as sources of pleasure, of abundance too. But some artists did embark on board, just like more and more um, men and women at the time. So there was kind of a drive to the sea, riches and its dangers. So, therefore, um, my claim is that the embarkment was not only a visual scene, it was also a situation that like being on board. Uh, this is what I would like to develop now. The expression, artiste embarqué, uh, draftsman embarked on board, it's difficult to translate, uh, appeared in 1785 for the first time for the La Pérouse Expedition. It's a great uh, change to that. So this expedition was a major naval expedition aimed at demonstrating the French imperial and um, scientific strength. On this painting, uh, which was uh, painted in uh, 1817 and which commemorated the expedition, the painter, uh, Nicolas Moncio, shows um, uh, Jean-François de la Pérouse receiving his instruction from uh, the King Louis XVI. So these instructions uh, were soon published, uh, and I will uh, read them quickly. Uh, Monsieur de la Pirouze will direct the draftsmen embarked on board, the frigate, the Boussole and the Astrolabe, to take view of all remarkable places and countries, portraits of the natives of different parts, addresses, ceremonies, games, buildings, boats and vessels, and all the productions of the land and the sea. All the drawings made during the course of the voyage all the boxes containing natural curiosities together with the descriptions given of them and all the collections of astronomical observations shall be delivered to the Sphere de la Pérouse. So the expression, dessinateur embarqué, appears. It meant actually the total commitment of these artists' maritime journey. And as a matter of fact, they never returned, uh, disappearing with the old crew in the South Pacific. Uh, after a wreck near the island of uh, Vanikoro in December 1788. So I think this expression, par um, comment, also raises a viewpoint of the artist's drawings in the same way as we speak today of journalists or anthropologists embedded with the military during armed conflicts. And in French, we say journaliste embarqué, pretty much like dessinateur embarqué. I think that this uh, common, this word, this range of meanings allow us to go beyond conventions of naturalist and proto-ethnographic drawings well studied today, to interrogate emotions and anxiety of exploration, as well as the violence of collecting, collecting image, and not only collecting artifacts in an imperial and colonial context. So, um, Despite the tragic outcome of the expedition, La Pérouse uh, had 36 drawings which were brought back to Versailles. Um, the maps and engravings made from the drawings were published in a separate atlas. Here, the frontispiece, uh, the atlas was published in 1797. So in the frontispiece, uh, one who recognized here, for example, the allegory of painting uh, and the natives here looking at the map of uh, La Perouse travel. Here, uh, Akuto is handling naturalist specimens on, in the drawings. So no less than four draftsmen embarked in this expedition, which was uh, somehow unusual in France. All of them had different backgrounds and training, trainings. Jean-Louis Robert Prévost embarked as a draftsman for botany. Another one, Gaspard Duché de Vinci, embarked as a draftman of figures and landscape. So, uh, Gaspard Duché de Vinci, I will uh, speak about him later, um, has been trained at the Royal Academy of Painting, and he was um, a pupil of Joseph Marivien, specialist of 18th century French painting, but anyway, and so he's most well known for this kind of Vinci. Um, Guillaume Prévost, the third one, embarked also as a draftsman for botany. And the last one was 
Marine Officer François Michel Blondella, who had participated in the war of um, American War of Independence and who had great skills in drawing, but uh, rather as an amateur. <coughs> so, two naturalist draftsmen, one draw painter and a marine officer gifted in drawing. Different trajectories that testify to a visual ambition for an expedition which had a learned objective but was also clearly part of an imperial rivalry with Great Britain um, in the South Sea. So the fate of these drawings was extraordinary. Uh, they were sent back to France on different occasions. It's quite a very moving, actually, to see them. Um, the last ones were transported by the young Jean-Baptiste Barthélemy de Lesseps. Uh, so uh, happy for him, he disembarked uh, uh, in Kamchatka and brought back the journal of Papier Woods with the drawings from Siberia to uh, Versailles. So these drawings appear today as almost uh, fantastic remnants of this expedition. The uh, state of preservation is quite remarkable. Um, Duché de Vinci, among other drawings, executed a particularly spectacular view of Rapa Nui, uh, Island, uh, where he developed a narrative on the encounter between the natives and the French. Significant ethnographic details, here you can see, um, ears elongated and pierced, uh, are visualized, but they remain rather anecdotal. The image here is presented um, as a genre scene. You can see here Duché representing himself uh, drawing, um, very, um, making a portrait of a native, uh, acti an activity uh, which arouses uh, curiosity among the natives. So European, I mean, it means like kind of the European prestige of human figuration here. Um, he picture also on the right the measurement of one statue by a scientific. Another detail here is the gift of one mirror, uh, which is a topical scene in literature uh, at the time, and so some images. And finally, a, um, a detail showing a supposedly reciprocal exchange of a woman here um, and a French officer on the left. And finally, just a detail of the signature. As I and uh, <laughs> it's written, what interests me today is that it's written dessiné d'après nature than the scene. So the scene um, is presented as made after nature, but here, imperial conquest is clearly reformulated in the language of gallant encounters and peaceful commerce and, and the natives. Something I see as an heritage of the tradition of gallantry as it was deployed in the visual and performative arts. Um, in the reign of Louis XIV and the first half of the 18th century. So it is not here that imperialism is evacuated, but it is formulated as a gallant encounter in the peaceful language of seduction, which was implemented in artistic institutions of the French monarchy, especially the academies. So what is interesting is that all these drawings, the 36 drawings, were engraved. The, in the atlas, seven except two. And these drawings represent uh, Port des Français, which is a uh, place in Alaska, in the North Pacific, uh, which La Perouse describes as a commercial base for the natives, but which would prove to be very strategic as a commercial base for the French against the British, because as you can see of the natural protection of the bay. So the drawing by Duché de Vinci uh, is here spectacular, capturing the beauty of the site, uh, it's taken from the continent and magnifies the proportions of the wilderness. Um, so I'm not going to describe it, but you know, there is a real uh, work on the whites here. It's really... Um, the other view of Port des Français is made by Blondella, the marine officer I told you uh, before. And here uh, you see the view is taken from the, from the shore or from a canoe, so it's not a bird's view. Uh, it's closer and it's remained uh, centered on the human scene, giving ethnographic details rather than the feeling of nature. In the drawing, Blondella captures the material exchanges and encounters 
between the natives and the French. He, uh, the French show an axe. The natives show, you know, an ornament, so material encounter. These two drawings were not engraved in Paris, but the comparison so of uh, Blondelas drawing this one is this one, the, an engraving which was published in the Atlas, uh, reveal that uh, it was directly used to represent a scene of shipwreck. Shipwreck, which actually took place during the arrival of the French in Port des Français in 1786, and which costed lives um, to several members of the, of the crew. So what is interesting is that the scene of silence and calm painted in Alaska by Blondella was completely reinterpreted in Paris. And Nicolas Ozan, who is a marine painter, imagined the new drawing, um, actually transformed uh, the narrative content of the drawing, the first drawing by um, Blondella. So first, a shipwreck, which is not in the drawing, but engraving. And another engraving, which is not in the drawing, is a scene of massacre. Um, also, this image was uh, imagined by Ozan and engraved by uh, um, This massacre actually took place um, in December 1787, and it um, posted life to uh, the captain, uh, L'Angle de Florio, and 10 crew members. This episode of the massacre was reported at the end of La Perouse journal, but it was not visually represented. So in total, we have two uh, dramatic engravings that are not taken from the portfolio of the drawings and that propose a very different narrative uh, from that of the drawing. I see here like a dissonance uh, in the collection of naturalist drawings executed by the artist embarked on board, and the narrative images executed by artists made in the metropolis. Nicolas Ozan never left France. So the iconography of the shipwreck, uh, with dramatic ambience and the typical use of pathos, had become very fashionable in the metropolis at that time, and while the scene of massacre executed during the revolution, like we were in the 1797, as I said, um, probably after the terror in France, waves toward a new kind of iconography. On the contrary, in the drawings brought back from the expedition, dangers were not represented, fear was absent, and violence was best. Artists magnified the majesty of the site and the beauty of nature. This dis dissonance, I think, brings us back to the genre of marine painting, a genre which encountered much success in the 18th century. Point I want to make on storms and shipwrecks and armchair aesthetic. <laughs> I don't know if we can say that, but yeah, yeah. 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 this way. Okay. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, representations of shipwrecks uh, in paintings were very successful in the 18th century. So if you have this other one by Pilmont, and another one, uh, of course, by Joseph Vernet, uh, 1772. Hans Blumenberg, uh, in Shipwreck with Spectator, has underlined the trope of the shipwreck in Enlightenment philosophy. He argued that representations of storm and shipwreck, but also of embarkment, were metaphors of a philosophical reflection. They gave an aesthetic form a reflection on the relationship of man with a nature conceived as incommensurable. Um, so the emergence of the sublime, uh, as you know, reappeared with force in the second half of the century uh, around Edmund Burke. And uh, Burke theorized um, the sublime as a paradoxical aesthetic pleasure, um, taking the sublime where it was in the sphere of uh, rhetoric, to, to say very quickly, um, interpret it more in a sensitive, almost a phy physiological dimension, rightful horror of Burke. So this natural sublime took shape as a new conception of the universe after the Copernican revolution had questioned geocentrism and geostatism. Storms and shipwrecks, so fashionable then, appeared at the conjunction of this new philosophy of nature and on the other side, a more intense exploration of the world 
in the colonial and commercial expansion of Europe. Um, so, as you can see, the list we can say is that uh, Vernet's storms and shipwrecks were rarely contextual or referential. Often you cannot say where they were painted. Actually, they referred to an aesthetic position, that of the viewer. As Blumenberg argued, this position has become the only one possible in a world whose controls have changed, like first geographically, because uh, the widening of the horizons of the known world, of course, so uh, no, based on the Pacific, but all philosophically, because the security of the spectator was no longer guaranteed. Why? Because the ground with earthquakes was ready to give way under men's feet, as well as the sky. As an example, uh, in novels of the time, as in Voltaire's Micromegas, we see giants here, giants, you know, who are provoking a wreck because he's taking a, a small ship. I love this. <laughs> so, you know, what is that world? Um, so only the aesthetic space was able to uh, guarantee the security of the spectator. Thus, marine paintings of Vernet were not only trophies for uh, amateur cabinets, they were also traces of a philosophical experience, that of the meaning of our human existences in a time when these were troubled by the new philosophy of nature. So obviously, the new philosophy of nature, born from the development uh, of Earth and nature, was not the only one, the only mutation at stake. Um, the presence of marine paintings, along with uh, not nautical metaphors, but I will not go there, contributed to aestheticize France's imperial ambitions and the importance of navigation, especially at the Seven uh, uh, Years' War, for a commerce and an empire. So here again, I think Hans Blumenberg is much useful to think the connection between the sea, commerce, and capitalism, uh, as maritime trade necessitated a lot of uh, financial capital. In his book, he pointed out uh, the connection, and I quote him, between two elements characterized by liquidity, water and money. And he goes, he goes further, arguing that, I quote him again, it will be one of the fundamental ideas of the Enlightenment that shipwreck is a price that must be paid in order to avoid that complete calming of the sea winds that would make all worldly commerce impossible. So shipwrecks were the necessary condition for global ma maritime trade and uh, um, of course, uh, La Perouse expedition had commercial goals. And one of the goals was to develop French trade in the, in the Pacific. This entanglement between navigation, science, and empire lies therefore at the core of La Perouse expedition. However, all images that survived from the expedition, from the expedition sorry, depicted a peaceful world. Images obscured violence, while on the contrary, the writings of La Perouse in the journal did not hesitate to record acts of violence from the side of the Europeans and from the Navy. So, for example, in Rapanui, I go, I'm going back to uh, we, um, the expedition only stayed eight to ten hours, which is really very short, actually. Uh, and La Perouse commented upon the violence made native women. They committed but the natives, an act of violence on two young girls of about 13 or 14 years, bringing them near us in hopes of receiving a reward. The repugnance of these young Indians proved that the law of the country was violated in their persons. None of our people availed them of the barbarous rights thus attempted to be converted. And if certain moments were devoted to nature, desire and consent were mutual, and the women made the first offers. But I think the description. Um, the textual description contradicts the gallant scene penned by Duché de Vinci, totally immersed in an artistic language that the European academies trained by gallantry and reciprocity. So how can we explain that dissonance again between the text and the image? As a matter of fact, La Perouse described several times acts of violence during the expedition, but artists could not visualize them. 
In La Perouse's account, the contrast between the beauty of the Polynesian islands and the ferocity of their inhabitants is very strong after the massacre of his crew in um, September 1787. Um, I don't have time to read it, but he's very, you know, deep, obviously. Long passage and important passage. Uh, the engraving reflects La Perouse's hostility and relies on his account. Uh, but this, as I said, this was not made on board. On board, there was one, one drawing was made. This is it. This is just a plan of Lance du Massacre. So just the word, just the word massacre is end on the, on the paper. Um, like the site is described as a trap. It's like there is silence on the page. Ending by. Actually, there were exceptions to the silence of artists confronted to violence. William Hodges painted in 1776 a sketch that are used for an engraving in the published account of Cook's voyage. Um, uh, so an episode during uh, which Cook fired him here uh, on the Milanesian and was forced to return to his ship. But this painting was not painted on board. It was painted in London after the events the illustrated publication of Cook's Voyage. For very narrative, again, in its content, the painting was supposed to illustrate a publication, not to record an event. So, embarked draftsmen were trained to collect curiosities, cultural differences on the white pages or on the canvas, mostly scenes with a picture of a European vision. They were not to record the sudden eruption of violence. Trained in the circle of the academy, they reproduced Galanchim, depict encounters with the natives, and when they were trained as naturalists, they offered truth to nature views which erased contingent violence. So I think that this allows us maybe to go beyond the powerful viewpoint of truth to nature images as uh, theorized by Lorenda Stone and Peter Gallison in their book on the history of objectivity. So how can we understand the history of objectivity in the light of imperial and material encounters? Collecting images after nature, like collecting artifacts, took place in situation of material co-presence, the draftsman, and the specimen, often driven by misconception, anxiety, and sometimes violence. Embarked draftsmen did not report this. And their images also erased the potential of violence of the contrary, as we saw in the drawing by Duché de Vinci, human figuration was represented uh, as an admirable feature of uh, European superiority on the natives. Often is, actually. The French Empire was built supposedly on idealistic forms of encounters, an ideology of fraternization and free collaboration between the French and the Native Americans. Embarked artists on La Perouse expedition were not the embedded journalists, nor the, the war correspondents of the modern age. They were not to record uh, episodes of encounter. On the contrary, they remained attached to a cultural anthropology characterized by global curiosity, committed to, commi um, to collect the natural or artifactual uh, differences of the global world, and then to bring them back in Europe. So in this frame, the trope of embarkation associated with peaceful commerce, like commerce in French, worked well with this um, idealistic and mercantilist view of empire. And this adorned some major architectural complex in the French metropolis. So to conclude, I say my question. Embarkment can be maybe a useful notion to underline the tension or paradox of enlightenment visual practices for the edge of revolution. On one side, an armchair aesthetic fueled with gallantry, battles of sentimentality, while images made on board were unloaded with the material traces of encounter made of anxiety and sometimes violence. Much more than the truth to nature uh, paradigm, maybe, um, this idea of embankment conveys the importance of the total engagement, the material presence of the draftsman during the encounter, but also the vexed epistemology of the images made on board, um, insisting on the controversial ethics of the embedded draftsmen 
and the ideological frame they were taking in. Thank you. Fascinating. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of Jeffrey, do you want to go ahead and start us off? I will start, but not if there are others. But you, you sort of ended by answering the question that I was going to ask you, which is about this seeming similarity. And I did not know that the word for an journalist today is embarqué. So that's super interesting. And you ended by separating those. So I just wonder, you know, the it's that you're you're signaling their training right in this academic frame and then the instructions that they were explicitly given um i'm wondering do you see a space for the actual experience of being embedded or embarked uh, that reinforced that resistance recording things that we're not recording and i wonder also then looking forward from this moment you see a tipping point when artists who are embedded or embarked in this kind of project, stop doing what they're told and start doing what we recognize at a journalist today or actually what we expect from them. Where was that shift or, or have you run far enough forward in time to detect a change? So those are sort of two main questions about the experience of how that differs from what we might think. Uh, so you mean a, a shift uh, in history? Yeah, I'm basically asking at what point do the violent images start being made also by the people who are marked or embedded? I think maybe, yeah, it's a very good question. I think it's uh, the question of uh, um, I think what you can read is that the 19th century movement. Uh, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Oh, also, but I think it's interesting what you said. It's because of the interest. Sometimes, uh, I, it's not only um, theology, but it's also like or even because also there's a new sense of. Too. Like the, the, the actuality, the event, the quality of the event can, can happen, that can happen. Uh, while uh, as I, I showed you, uh, there is a sense of curiosity, differences, and you know, but no. So I think also it's really to that big question. So it strikes me that du commerce as a metaphor can be used in the economic sense, but also in an atmosphere. Exactly. So this, this is in the culture at this that is, moment. Yeah, uh, perhaps is, that changes or erodes in the course of the 19th okay. century. Sure. And so du commerce is really something like I studied more uh, related to calendry. Uh, like commerce sure. in the 19th century means not only trade, but in French, it really means all uh, relationship. People like being in commerce with somebody. So yes, it is. Uh, I think in the nineteenth century. I think at the end, around eighteen hundred, yeah. Uh, there's a change. Commerce means trade, more. separation of the meaning. By the time of the post uh, Yeah, sure. <laughs> Fantastic work. It's so exciting. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to go back to the I think also about the ambiguity of the way the <coughs> Vato painting is thought as an embarkment or a debarkment. And I wonder if it wouldn't be also extremely useful to think about the whole project as a debarkment mm -hmm. in terms of predation. Because what <coughs> thinking of about the change in mentality in, in terms of thinking. We've always thought about the colonial adventure in the way of the great expeditions of the 15th century, about people going somewhere. They don't know where they're going and they want to discover the places, etc. But now if we can think about all this story in terms of predation and getting back some, 
because the idea is to come back with the material, mm -hmm. come back with the knowledge, come back with the images. Almost, it's not so much the embarkment that is important, but the debarkment and the return journey that is the most important then going there, how yeah. people go back. And I wonder if like, we can make something out of that in terms of, it doesn't work very well with artists embarqué <laughs> because it's not artists débarqué, but the, 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 what is important is what is basically what, people, what the metropolis gets back. It's not what the people who experience the travel gets out of the travel. It's not about them, it's about the people who commissioned them. And you, you show very well the way they transform the images in the metropolis and they, they rewrite the entire odyssey. But it, it is about the metropolis. It's not about the places or the actors of the visit. In English, it's very complicated. <coughs> Boarding, unloading, unloading, I mean, all these words. Uh, but yeah, sure, the idea, I think you cannot sing one without, uh, without singing the other. So it's really a process of, as you said, uh, getting back something, collecting something. Um, so sure, I have to think about it. And this is why also I read the instructions of Cruz because he said everything goes back to images and the uh, natural. Uh, so um, it has to get back. Uh, so and also this is why we can speak about an idea of mercantilism too, like they are they collecting amassing. Yeah, I totally agree. I don't know really how to articulate. Yeah, totally. yeah. We have one question from our virtual audience, and then we'll have a question from Elisa, and this is from Tab Holmes, who also wants us to speak a bit more loudly, I think because of the, <laughs> the, uh, the microphone. Um, but she wants to know what distinguishes 18th century, in your view, what distinguishes 18th century French artists from those of previous centuries, especially those from the Netherlands, who also made and memorialized sea journeys? Do you see a kind of difference yeah. from you know, the sort of maritime art and the art of embarkation for that period? Yeah. To this? Well, I, I think it's a very large question, so I cannot really answer everything. I would say that the first the motive of the gallantry for me is maybe French, and I'm here uh, using Anna Vianna's work uh, book on La France Galante and explain uh, how you know, gallantry was kind of explained from France. But I think that, for example, uh, the Netherlands marine um, painting not uh, use, mobilize the But I think that, for example, the armchair aesthetic to Netherlandish paintings, the pictures there, the collection. So this is a, a European. And um, well, yeah, uh, uh, and implemented this kind of scenes of maritime. But now, <laughs> yeah. Lisa, you had a question? Yes, I have. Um, Personal curiosity was very interesting, and I personally researched stage design. So around the 1790s, there are some very minor performances in Paris um, about the travels of La Perouse, other that refer more to the travels of um, uh, the Captain Cook. And uh, it's, of course, unfortunately, nothing survives in terms of designs or uh, reviews from the magazines and newspapers. So, uh, but the very few information we have is that some of these performances are really focused on the ship, on how it was made. In few 
circumstances. They had the, uh, a, a real ship on the stage, another just the backdrop. And also uh, other performances refer to the encounter with the native and uh, they try just to develop this narrative of the global curiosity. They are very minor uh, performance. It's not, not something that big, but I wonder if you have some more information of possible exchanges between the artist and the theatrical um, representation of the same topic. I, I don't have. I'd love to hear more about it. <laughs> a, a real ship on stage. I mean, they had very few accounts, so I'm not sure how big was the ship and like how, you know, because they weren't performed for major theaters, just one was performed for the Théâtre de Fédo, which was, you know, a big, but actually at that time was called Théâtre de Monsieur, so it was one of the richest theaters that would invest in decoration, but somehow some of the performances weren't successful. So I'm not sure like how detailed, but there's a certainly an exchange between these decorators and the artists. Yeah, I was never able to find more. <laughs> so the artists disappeared, like the one who said disappeared. I, I know that Luther Borg was involved. Um, uh, I don't know more, uh, but um, oh, like Nicolas Ozan, all the members, um, Official. You are also engineers very often, so objects and but uh, it's speculative yet. <laughs> Hi, this is just such a marvelous work and presentation, and thank you so much. Um, and I, I've just been thinking about Cook's expedition the whole time, and you know, if only Lapiahouz had returned, um, and the multiplicity of documents that, that go along with it. And so when Hawksworth published the account of Cook's voyages, that was illustrated, you know, you have the Hodges illustration, um, Cook really didn't like what Hawksworth did with it, and wrote his own account. And then um, Parkinson, uh, who was the artist who died in Batavia on that first voyage, did a bunch of uh, imagery. And um, then obviously Banks has imagery, you know, and, and so I'm thinking more about the embarkment, you know, disembarkment question. And um, I don't know if there are parallels, um, maybe not with, obviously with, not with Left Who's because he didn't disembark, but, you know, with other expeditions, um, you know, were there illustrations for Bougainville or, you know, what, where, where you have the function of the imagery that is done in, um, I guess the media would be like watercolor or drawing or, you know, that's on board to um, document practical information for governments and future navigators versus the imagery done to sell empire, um, which would then also perhaps be more with oil and, you know, in a, in a grander way. Thank you very much. This is a big question also. <laughs> uh, yes, of course, we have to compare. Uh, beginning. Uh, so, um, uh, in terms of um, what I what I read and what I know is that uh, yeah, Cook a very Paid great attention to what was uh, uh, for example, you know that the sketch I, I, I showed you, uh, which is to my knowledge the only one because I, I researched, like, are there any other episodes of violence? You know, that could have been raised actually. This is the only one I found, like, this only one. And um, this is the only image, not to speak about media, uh, which represent violence. It was, once again, so it was not made on board, so it's made to illustrate Cook's uh, voyage, and um, Cook wanted it to be illustrated. Um, so it was like, spoke with uh, the art. Um, 
I don't know if there is a difference between um, yeah, of oil painting and uh, um, would be supposed to uh, sell. Uh, I think that the, the ideological frame is more transversal, like you can find not that they are trying to sell empire, but they are embedded in. So um, this is why the truth to nature uh, scheme does not really, I'm not really buying it totally because I think it's part of the empire ideology. Uh, and so we cannot oppose uh, a media like the, the pencil and the oil painting, you know. So this is, this is maybe what, what I would, where I would go in a way. Um, well. I don't know if I answered your question. No, you did, Dan. Yeah. Verification question also from our, our virtual audience from Nadia Zonis, which is about the image, the print of the massacre that you showed, which mm -hmm. was made afterwards. And I think she was wondering whether you were making a parallel or whether maybe you think the artist was making a parallel between attacks on colonists and explorers and that massacre scene and the terror. Or were you just saying that they were contemporaneous? Okay. No, yeah, what I'm, what I, because there is one idea I had is that uh, the theme of massacre is something which is really emerging in those years. Uh, painting a massacre, like a contemporary massacre. You don't have scenes like that in academic painting. You know? And uh, to me, I related to the massacre in France during the revolution. You have images of the massacre uh, men against men else, you know, so this kind of iconography of massacre appear in, in this way I, I spoke about the age of revolutions. Also in, in uh, Haiti, you have images of uh, you know, very ideological images of uh, slaves uh, massacring uh, white uh, population. So this new iconography of a contemporary event massacre is, is Appears um, so, yeah, like when Ozan uh, imagined in 1797, and I think that a new sense of temporality brings kind of iconography. I actually had a question, and I think you did as well. So, I'll um. I'm not sure it's really that well formulated as a question. I mean, I'm fascinated by this idea of the sort of shipwreck scene, well, Bloomberg's analysis of it, the, the kind of incommensurability mm. of man and nature. And I've also, you know, heard that shipwrecks are sometimes meant to be um, metaphors or analogs for financial disaster. You know, Bateau apparently made an image yeah. of a shipwreck that mm. may, may or may not be related to yeah. his own loss of money yeah. in the 1720s. Scandal. But, mm. but so if, if shipwrecks don't, Typically, you know, if, if they're kind of the armchair aesthetic, they're, they're not typically made by the onboard of the, you know, the embarqué artists. Is it because the artists you're saying are more kind of invested in suggesting that there's a commensurability between man and nature, and that in fact, you know, that they are meant to have this kind of mutual relationship, mm -hmm. one of galanterie, of du commerce, of, of mm -hmm. domination. And you know, I'm also thinking about the the kind of iconography of, of galanterie, and I think what you're you're saying that these artists are kind of using it as a way to suggest that the French have a kind of special, sort of seductive, even natural relationship of commerce with the inhabitants or with these landscapes or, or territories. But Galantry also is, is a set of kind of mm -hmm. artificial codes of behavior. Uh -huh. And I think over the course of the 18th century, sometimes that gets called into question, the sort of artificiality of it. And so I wonder if there's a kind of trajectory of, of galanterie in terms of either the way the artists are using it or maybe the way that people are interpreting it, you know, mm -hmm. could it ever be um, viewed in a, in, as a, in a kind of negative sense, almost as a kind of critique of imperial exchange, using these sorts of artificial aristocratic codes that made mm -hmm. themselves seem also yeah. bankrupt or... Difficult to answer because Matter of fact, I don't know right now. That kind of intuition. Uh, that I sure I think gallantry is a motif of the first half. I mean first half of the yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but it's more related. I think it's it was so strong uh, in the 
Share your visions of who is a beginning of colonization, like the, uh, the model of uh, making uh, the relationship with the um, other, like the gallantry, the galant, sauvage galant. Yann Galant is a like, extreme example of that, like in the 17th. Then I think it's kind of the, the beginning of something else. So yeah, but what is it? I don't know. <laughs> I think the the it does not disappear. Not gonna Maybe I you know, just showed an example uh, in this. But there is something else. Uh, a critique. Uh, yes, a critique also because um, there is a kind of. Um, Motif of the prostitutes and uh, you know how the women, uh, I mean, the mutual consent of gallantry um, seems to be questioned maybe through the women who were supposed to go there, you know, like Manon Lescaut. So, what is it about the novel by you know, women love and you know. He's flirting with the model, you know, objective. So there is something like dignity, uh, mm -hmm. the rise of something you know, not transparent. There's something else. The critic, yeah, I guess there is something here. So what I like is that the idea of gallantry and uh, commensurability, because uh, you make the parallel between uh, uh, incommensurability and gallantry. I think gallantry was a way to adjust, uh, a way to anthropologically understand this adjustment in literature, in art, how to adjust with the text, with the others, like uh, just the gap. Yeah, exactly. Through codes and rules. Yes. Uh, something. <laughs> what yeah, did you yeah. say? On yeah, I just keep thinking about the term onboarding, which has become so pervasive in English. I don't know if there's like an equivalent term in, in yeah. English, but it's just bad. <laughs> no, but I mean, that's not really appropriate for what you were just saying. I think the, the idea of bridging the gap, that the, yeah. the commensurability can yes. be sort of, um, that gallantry can be a way to because get beyond that problem. It's a way to uh, question this kind of, uh, all these images of art, which are very much about pleasure, fiction, and you don't know what yeah. relate to it. It meant something. Why was it so important to be so in pleasure, so much? Uh, so, you know, it's not only a question of uh, art theory, but like, like Roger de Pille from the special, uh, who was an art theorist really of the 18th century and said that like, painting has to be of seduction, it has to seduce the eye. Why so? And so we are in a moment where, you know, the um, relationship with the world and, you know, very quickly. So I'm, yeah, I think. Is a way to there's this adjustment. Maybe. Oh, um, I had a question as to why. <coughs> what was the consequence of you bringing up Burke? But I wonder if, to some degree, there's some sort of analogy. If there's some sort of mediating function that you're using, and partly because then I was wondering, what is the aftermath of this? Is the idea that the aftermath is somewhere between Humboldt and Jericho, or is there something very different? If there's an, let's say, if, if you go forward to Burke and the sublime, mm -hmm. rather than, than, if this was merely a hint, then great. If this was a, a, a gesture forward to Burke and the sublime, then I'm curious as to what the meaning of that would be, or mm -hmm. what the meaning of that into romanticism. If that's where you, if that's what you had in mind. No, I think it's important because, um, of work and the sublime is important, I think. I wanted to show that it's not a question only of aesthetics, the of aesthetics but uh, by bringing the uh, this philosophy of nature. Work um, and this new philosophy of nature, post Copernican, then we, we understand that it's a 
Um, so it's not, I don't want to bring him into the discussion just because it's Burke, because he's a specialist and I'm not like, you know, bringing something. I don't really know, but I think it's really important. Like, why is the sublime in the 18th century so important? We, we, we kind of uh, get why, if it's just in physics once again. Uh, I want to, to make the connection with something more uh, about um, census, but also about the transport. I don't know if, and so yeah, I think Humboldt is completely into that. I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, I mean sublime is a language of, in aesthetics, is a language of, uh, of uh, natural history. This is what the point I want to well, What is the connection with Humboldt? Well, actually, that was much more useful for me. Okay. The question, Rebecca, very naive and slightly ill-formed. Um, um, I really like this idea of uh, armchair aesthetic, um, turning into uh, the sort of that will guarantee what identified as. I was wondering if, like, is that. Uh, so one alternative could just be that it's just a merely new form of a memento. I think of that alternative. Um, the other question has to do with um, uh, like what kind of intentionality or agency uh, the way they're choosing to um, depict uh, these scenes in the vocabulary you see this as a as sort of like a deliberate ideological of what they're doing, or is it just they're simply going with the only aesthetic vocabulary that, that they know and have been trained in? And finally, I wanted to ask like, what, like if you're having kind of the more violent scenes, like after the fall on the continent, you're, you're having these somehow like, they're more gallant, uh, the draftsmen on board, like, what does this suggest about creating, allow to do with? Um... Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, the memento mori, yes, I think, uh, well, you know, it's not a shipwreck, yeah, the iconography of a ship. 17th. So yeah, there is this um, there is this tradition. Very good, uh, yeah. And uh, you have actually real memento mori of the 18th century in churches with. Uh, The second question is really a big question. Oh. <laughs> I don't think it's only, I don't want to say it's only ideological. This is what I built something as an argument because it's very easy if you say what. But then how, how can you, can it be possible to be specific and to articulate uh, the question of the training? Also the question of the emotions. This is why I brought the term emotions and anxiety. Because, um, you know, so it's a question, also the, the historiography of emotions. And so um, I think they have an aesthetic vocabulary and they use it and they are framed into it, but you know, sometimes, um, I don't know, but my idea is that um, gross men on board, um, why is that that people in writing can write? Uh, the question of the medium, actually, La Perouse, it can describe what's happening. Very precise. But, and... I wonder if it's also a, the very specific uh, thing that is to be on board of as a justice ship. Perus can write because he's the captain. 
And there's something very specific about being a captain on a ship where you absolutely have the entire authority at the highest level that can be in any kind of context. I wonder if, like, I do see that if you're an embarked artist, you have to, everything you do has to be approved and go through the approval of the captain. Like, the hierarchy is such aboard the ship that you know even on the on the battlefield kind of yeah. well, it's the same i would say if it's even worse because you can escape you cannot escape when you're on board of a ship and the the the, the punishments are even not the same they are harsher you see that I, I would i would make a, a real case in your study about this, the extreme specificity of what it is to be on a ship. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, and I wonder if like <laughs> the difference between what the Perus can write and what someone who is not a captain yes. can draw sure. has to do also with this IQ. I think there is a question of hierarchy. I think there is also the question of the between uh, and the draw um, and the image. Because we don't have images. Uh, I'm speaking about La Perouse, but other about Rothman. I search for other Rothman who were on board. And so what you have is drawings, but you never have this. I mean, you never. I want to be happy, you know, but I wonder if there is not also a specific medium. This is why training is uh, important. But is it not the destination? Oh. Who is going to read when, when La Perouse writes? I guess if he doesn't, he thinks like, who's going to, who is he writing for? He's writing for the king. And maybe afterwards, if the king approves, it could be translated in print and be accepted. And drawings are more, maybe a different audience. No, no, they, they, were, they were meant to be engraved. They were yeah. already prepared yeah. for the engraving. You see, they were yeah. framed, they were the, the titles, and they were engraved, except the two. I mean, the two, you know, they were transformed. So maybe there's, this a, is why there's a fear of like, if you want to prove that your expedition is a success, Maybe you don't want to show that the violent encounter. But uh, in La Perouse journal, it's very, it's very clear about the violence of the of the people. For example, the scene of massacre is really described. It's really like it's the end of the myth of the Sauvage. Like he's against the armchair philosophers. Like I don't tell me that some savages are good, and it's really very. Um, I have to put it. I mean, you know, it's very. But you don't have a visual. Is why. Um, I wonder if there is. I agree with the hierarchy. No, no, I, agree with I agree with. Uh, but in terms of media, I'm still. I wonder if that your last question was about distance. You know, I wonder if that has anything to do with. You know, the, I mean, I guess La Perouse is writing on board, but maybe there's something also about making it. I don't know. I'm, I'm also just trying to get back to your yes. last question. No, but I think, so we, yeah, your last question is very yes, distance. Because it's both in terms of uh, uh, psychological distance and uh, space, you know. So I think, yeah, the question of distance is, is very good. So you have a question? Yeah, and then Sarah? Yeah, thanks so much. I, I think there's three thoughts that come to, to mind. The first one, as you were kind of saying, I want to articulate this idea of chivalry or how do you think about that articulation? It's like, well, actually, if you put it back in, in, in the context in which it's done, the big debate at the time is about sociability. Everything's about sociability. That's a discussion you have with Rousseau, it's a discussion with Hume, Smith. And all of these terms relate to sociability. Du commerce relates to sociability. So maybe I did those are thoughts, like maybe one of the ways of trying to articulate this. Second thought was, at the end, I like that you're trying to articulate the relationship between on the one hand you know, I wonder whether enlightenment didn't kind of appear sufficiently in this discussion. Because on the one hand, there's this desire to show technical mastery of nature, and we're going to do all these exhibitions, and we're bringing 
civilization, et cetera, et cetera, to the rest of the world. Yet at the same time, then we have shipwrecks. And there is this, this kind of attempt to master nature, but then nature is not too happy about that, both in its own ways, personalized nature. And I say, well, maybe within that framework, if you, but maybe what's helpful there is looking at, you know, Bruno and Horkheimer's dialectic of enlightenment, where the whole, whole element of trying to master nature, but then it not kind of come back, mm-hmm. would be helpful in terms of trying to articulate the relationship in between. The final point then was, as you were talking, I just kept thinking of Napoleon. <laughs> because of yeah. Napoleon's exhibitions, yeah. right? So Napoleon does all the exhibitions, but all this data is in the service of establishing a new type of power, which is a different power to most of the powers you've been talking about so far, which is more with kingly power, royal power. That's different because Napoleon's doing something new. Napoleon is not king power, it's a new form of power which combines elements of democratic popular sovereignty with with a form of authoritarian centralism. Now it's just as because your your paintings that you showed do span this period. They go from before and they go to afterwards. So I was just wondering what role that played because that's also somebody who's participating in many ways. And then it's bringing all this stuff back to France to show that look, you know, I've gone to these countries I've, you know, they've been disastrous, most of the exhibitions, right? Egypt and all that doesn't work at all. Yet at the same time, this comes back and is legitimized, but it's legitimized in a form that's different to a lot of the things that you've shown there. So I was just, I was, I was listening to that. I was like, okay, your way, what, what would you say to that? Yes, yeah, so Helen, can you And uh, so, yeah, my only point was to put Napoleon back into gallantry. So, um, and like Montesquieu, La Berenal, when they're speaking about class, they're really speaking about socialism. So, this is why these scenes, visual scenes of uh, are so important. They are not uh, a side uh, that should be traded. But puts people together, the, the goods and the people together. So yeah, social. Um, but um, yeah, enlightenment and the revolt of the nature and yes, but for me, like Adorno and for example Adorno or Archimer is less useful, I would say, like a toolbox, maybe, uh, maybe because I and uh, precisely uh, Burke, Humanberg in the you know, like, Humanberg helps me understanding more why we, you have all these paintings, you know? So uh, I just uh, feel that more of the, uh, but it, uh, there's not the sense of disaster maybe, you know? Uh, I don't know, he's, you know, his thought is, you know, headed in this kind of Auschwitz like. You know. so here you don't have the same sense of disaster, ideology of progress. So you are very much still in this kind of thought, progress and, you know, sense of history. They are discovering the future in a way. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I just mean by that, that but they also progress then doesn't always work. That's why you have all the shipwrecks. Yeah, shipwrecks are necessary for progress and for capitalism. This is why, you know, I, I it's useful. Yeah, uh, you can, you know. And uh, um, Napoleon is very interesting. So thank you for mentioning him. Uh, I did some work on his the drawings of the which are also uh, <laughs> and uh, but uh, they are less known. The drawings of the Napoleon exhibition, I mean, are very not very known. Um, while the, the engravings are famous, and um, I do think they, they you can you can they belong in the same kind of framework. I mean, the medium is not the same because uh, it's. Uh, 
um, not exactly the same, but um, there is also a sense of adjustment, adjustment between uh, and uh, are being uh, in defect, obviously. So the adjustment here through other media. And um, I think that uh, Napoleon be belongs to this kind of um, uh, the, 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 the last expedition. It's the same ambition. Yeah, well, I just meant by that, sorry if I may, is just to say that the how uh, power and legitimacy is conceived has changed over this time period. Therefore, what impact that has in even, you know better, this materiality, et cetera, et cetera, than I do, I can't comment on that. Yeah. Maybe there's a continuity there. Yeah, yeah. But if you think about, you know, the debarkment, et cetera, when it's, when it's, especially when it's brought back to France, it serves quite a different purpose. The purpose is it's repurposed in such a way because a lot of this is about what is about uh, it's imperial science in both ways uh, of you know yes. but the imperial source knowledge both ways for me from my viewpoint but yeah i mean maybe i have to search more yeah, yeah just that sorry because I, I agree with you imperial thing it's i think it's a, the sources of domestic power which has changed and i think that's what i meant yeah. that's that's the element of same things repurposed, etc., but then used domestically, perhaps in a slightly different way. It's just a thought. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think we only have time for one more question. So, Sarah, you, it's yours. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of responsibility. Um, thank you, Shara. It's really wonderful to see how this work has evolved over time. Um, so, um, I guess I'll shift our attention away from the long durée to this question of geographic. Distance. So this is perhaps a question for both you and Meredith. You focused um, on images that emerged from these long voyages across the Pacific, across the Atlantic, where I, I imagine sort of the calculations of risk, commercial risk, risk of life were a little bit different than more local peregrinations around the Mediterranean. Or So I was wondering if the can articulate a difference in sort of the social relationships that are materialized or represented through these images in the oceanic distances versus those that we see articulated when Le Prince goes to Russia or Hilaire goes to the Ottoman Empire or the engineers, the savants go mm -hmm. to Egypt. Um, I, I wonder, that's maybe sort of a, a question not to be answered, but an invitation for us all to think. But since you work so much on the Mediterranean, Meredith, and my initial thought about that was like the farther they go, the more French it looks. But I yeah, no, <laughs> right, right. That's actually true. But, they, but, they, but I think that they do. The you know I can't I can't quite articulate, but they seem like the sort of the visual rhetoric or the way that these encounters yeah. are reckoned with seems really different depending on where they have to go. <laughs> well, and when it, it, the the question of distance and a lack of familiarity and a kind of incommensurability will lead to a kind of kicking in of the codes of the sort of familiar codes of representation. I don't know. This is yeah. this is really Sorry. for you. Yeah, but it's, I think no, it's no, a really no. important yeah. point that the the distance matters. Matters. <laughs> uh, it's difficult to answer. You. I mean, I like the way you put it, and I think it's interesting because. Um, I think that even though they, uh, those for example, artists went very far, they had to adjust. I think that I'm sure that the agency is different maybe when you are in the media than you move across. When you're in South Pacific, where you, you know. But um, the question of uh, Adjustments and local, you know, uh, is. Um, I would say also like a, a bit like Meredith that what I saw in those drawings and some others I. Uh, 
there is a kind of it's very French. It's not, you know, but the further they go, the more um, closer they are from the, what they are thinking. Time matters too. If you know it's going to be at least where your image gets back or longer or something, I mean that that affects that shapes. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. A kind of anticipation of a. I mean, I don't know. Morality of the the scene that you represent, how you represent it, the question of sort of. I mean, this is getting into like Jennifer Roberts' yeah. Yeah. territory, <laughs> yes. you know. And, um, but yeah, it is it is an important. And I. I don't know if there is much about the experience, just to get in a come full circle, but Jeffrey's first comment about that, the idea of the experience on board. I mean, is there, do we know anything about yeah. what, what artists bring with them? Do you have any kind of brushing up of, of the skills? So, you know, what's the, what is that experience like? You know, what's that life like? And if you, if, does anyone, do we have any records of that? For example, in La Perouse instructions, you know what, artists had on board. You know, what they brought with yeah. them. Sort of to Basile's point, are they being supervised um, literally or just because they're keenly aware of the nature of the shipboard society and the hierarchies? Or, you know, it would, I think, be interesting to explore if possible. Hero culture of... But to go uh, back to what you were saying, you know, the drawings we have, like the 36 drawings, uh, they are because they have been sent back mm -hmm. before. And what we know is that uh, La Perou sent them to the king because uh, it's supposed to show, so this is very clear in his drawing, uh, the talent of uh, they are uh, emblematic, of a, they have a special value. Uh, the other ones appeared because mm -hmm. of the wreck. So, you know, uh, this is why also they are so beautiful. So, in this, uh, what I mean by that is that, yeah, they were supervised. Who's must have chosen among some of them and they okay. went to the side. So, it's only a selection. Of course. Amazing. Of course, the art has the last word. The art survived. <laughs> yes. Um, well, thank you all. Thank you, Charlotte, thank first you. of all, first and foremost. Thank you also, yeah. Sabnus, and thank you, Sam and Amy, for organizing this event so beautifully. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>